This is the house the artist Frederick Church built for himself on a hill above the Hudson River. He called it Olana, which means our place on high in Arabic. From this viewing platform, he could survey American nature in all directions, in all its grandeur. Church was the leader of the Hudson River School, a group of nationalist painters who believed American landscape was unique, fresh, and a sign of divine will. His wilderness was always spectacular, waiting for the white man. It was his show, put on by God for him. And Church's paintings, like this view of Niagara Falls, with the green water sliding implacably over the drop, celebrate its primal power. Church didn't succeed by figuring what the public wanted and then painting it. He wanted what the public wanted, and he was rewarded for it. Now, this place is completely Church's conception, isn't it? E everything in it, from the house to the contents, is designed by him. The house, contents, landscape, even, in a sense, Church designed the view. Uh, and so, while you are in here, you are walking through a three-dimensional work of art. And what does the work tell us about the man? Oh, I, I think it tells us a great deal. Uh, he, when a friend asked him if he was the architect for the house, he replied, I made it out of my own head. And so, really, you're looking into Church's mind as you go through this house. Olana is an extraordinary mix of memories, souvenirs, and emblems of past civilizations. He did the house in the Middle Eastern style, not because he liked Arabs, but because Christ had lived in the Middle East. Frederick Church was devoutly Christian, a patriot, a model citizen, who believed that the sturdy American character needed refinement by past civilizations. Out of that would come a new American man who would lead the world. Most of his life, Church felt that, in some sense, he was the son of Cole, didn't he? Oh, very much the spiritual or intellectual inheritor of Cole, and uh, his landscapes developed themes that Cole developed. Such as? Further. Oh, the sense of uh, American bounty, uh, the extraordinary qualities of this continent, uh, the spirituality uh, of the Church found in nature, Cole found in nature. I mean, really, you looked in nature and found God. Church painted this solitary cross in the wilderness as a memorial to Cole. He was, in fact, Cole's only pupil. But his pictures praised American expansion rather than warned against it. The Hudson River was not enough for him. He also sought enormous exotic subjects in South America. Normally one doesn't use opera glasses in a museum, but that was how Frederick Church invited his public to view his great spectacle of Pan-American nature, the heart of the Andes. It went on view in 1859, and it pulled in 12,000 people in three weeks, thus becoming America's first one-man, one-picture blockbuster. He had it framed architecturally, literally as a kind of picture window, and surrounded it with palms and aspidistras. It made his reputation overnight. Church became, on the basis of the heart of the Andes, America's first real celebrity artist. In the 1850s, he went exploring in South America. The heart of the Andes is based on the sketches that he made. It's not a single view, but a combination of many, sealed by Church's signature, carved into a tree. His public loved the sheer abundance of the image. It's a painted encyclopedia of nature, but all its detail is unified in sublimity. The painter becomes God's stenographer. He reconciles science with religion. The whole thing is also a gesture of acquisition. The fact that it's framed like a window 
implies that the Andes are somehow right in the Yankees' backyard, that the North American viewer in some way owns the South American view. Two years later, when the Civil War broke out, Church fervently rallied to the cause of Lincoln and the Northern States. As his contribution to the war effort, he painted Our Banner in the Sky. It was circulated as a lithograph to Union troops. Landscape couldn't get more cornerly patriotic than this. The stars and stripes, a sign from heaven, something that couldn't be challenged without provoking God's wrath. As the Civil War raged, Church painted the eruption of the Mexican volcano Cotopaxi. It may have been an allegory, the sound of artillery was often likened to the roar of volcanoes. This was a landscape of catastrophe onto which Americans could easily project their feelings about the conflict that was tearing their country apart. Eruptions burst the calm of nature, the sun is dimmed by ash and smoke, but its light burns through, predicting the victory of the Union. But was a heroic, optimistic landscape art possible when the very earth of America had become the mass grave of a generation? Some artists were much less rhetorical. They reflected on a quite different scene. Not the West, but the East. Not the disputed land, but the neutral and timeless sea. Not images of struggle, but those of peace. They were the American Luminists. The painter John Kensett saw the sea as an emblem of consciousness, silence, an immense reflective calm. His surfaces were tight, without strong brush marks, a continuous stipple of light. Luminism was painting's counterpart to the feelings of the American transcendentalists, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, I float on a vast ocean of thought without rock or headland. I am from the beginning, knowing no end, no aim. The sea becomes a metaphor of eternity. It suspends narrative. Nothing happens. In Martin Johnson Heed's The Coming Storm, stillness descends on the black water, the white sail draped over a rock, the lone watcher and his dog, and the intensity of the long moment is extreme, with everything near and far in exact focus, like a Salvador Dali. The Luminists didn't go searching for spectacle. They used what was on their doorstep. In Fitzhugh Lane's case, a narrow slice of coast around Gloucester, Massachusetts, with its tidal bays, its rocks and shipping. But to most Americans, such images would have looked like dreams in a backwater. 